Welcome to the OKD Working Group meeting for June 7th of the year 2022. Uh, the agenda is um, in the chat and it's also available on the calendar invite and we'll post it again to make sure any folks who have just joined have it. And uh, take a moment to look over the agenda, see if there's anything that we missed. We do have a, a, an action-packed uh, meeting and um, Give me one second here. Actually, Dusty is going to pop in as well. Uh, he just needs me to hand him. Dusty will be here in a second. And uh, we have guests today, so we're going to keep things at um, about 15 minutes per guest. That'll fit our guests, and then 15 minutes for the various um, uh, updates that we usually have here. Um, so don't forget to put your name uh, in the agenda doc as an attendee, just so we know that you were here. And um, that allows us to um, keep track of if there's important information that someone needs to know and they weren't here, and, and we need to get, uh, get that to you. Uh, all right, let's start out with um, OKD release updates with Christian. Take it away. Yeah, sure. Uh, I think this is a short one, so uh, I'm not really news anymore. Um, so Vadim's cut another release, and he did it uh, the weekend before last weekend. Um, I haven't seen any, any bugs particularly reported for this version. Um, if you do have any, please file an issue on our tracker. Um, yeah, other than that, I think that's that's it already. That's it already. Nice and short. Does anyone have any questions or feedback in terms of uh, OKD releases? Engineering. Uh, short feedback. Uh, I did install it, uh, and uh, it does seem to fix the uh, uh, Ceph Rook issue. Uh, at least uh, all of my PVs. Uh, were there with uh, no touching or hand holding, and uh, things seem to uh, to work uh, great. So that's uh, thank you for that. Yeah, I think we uh, we unpinned the kernel because uh, a fix was merged and backported into into Fedora. So that issue, yeah, hopefully it's gone. Yeah, awesome. Hey Christian, have you heard anything about um, this issue of? Uh, incorrect URLs to Docker images in the samples. Um, the, we've, we've been getting reports of it, but no one's really delved into it yet. I haven't really seen it on a live cluster. I've seen something similar in CI recently where we were hitting the Docker hub uh, pull limit. Uh, because some of those images might still be coming from Docker Hub. I, um, th there was uh, someone posted another issue today, and it seems like all of the issues that couldn't be pulled were CentOS 7 base images. That's yeah. So um, they might be deprecated. I'm not sure about the state of them. And there is a, a workaround in the docs. I also linked the docs where you can uh, manually remove deprecated images. Apparently, that doesn't happen on its own. Um, so that might be a way. Apparently, it, it was tested to remove the memory, <clears> and they were recreated somehow. So I don't I don't really know. Um, but I think we'll have to um, Who should we file a bug on this? <laughs> there, there should be a samples operator component. Parts. OK. Um, and if there isn't, uh, please ping me and I'll find it. OK, excellent. We'll, we'll put one in on that then. All right, anything else, folks, uh, in terms of OKD uh, engineering and releases? All right, let's move on then to uh, Fedora Core OS updates with uh, Dusty. We'll start out with Dusty. Hey, y'all, can you hear me? Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I don't have anything too uh, groundbreaking. Um, just wanted to re note that all streams. Of Fedora Core OS are are on Fedora 36 now, as of a few weeks ago. Um, we actually have the second update 
for our stable stream that's based on Fedora 36 going out later today. Uh, so basically, um, you know, this is our second round of updates for Fedora 36 on our stable stream. Hopefully people haven't hit too many issues with that, but let us know if, if you see any. Um, we also updated our just, Nutanix. Okay, uh, sorry, Dusty, just a quick note. Okay, is still on Fedora 35, even though we're yep. rebuilding Epcos with the Fedora 36 manifests using Fedora 35 packages at the moment. So it's a bit, uh, yeah, it's a bit messy right now. Yeah, that's okay. Uh, yeah, that's that's perfectly fine. This is kind of like, uh, you know, if OKD were trying to test against Fedora 36 to here are some changes. Um, uh, so also our Nutanix artifacts that we're shipping in Fedora Core OS are uh, now using QCAL internal compression instead of being externally compressed. So instead of a QCAL 2.gz or xz, I forget which one it was, it's now just a .qcal2. Uh, and this update was made at the request of Nutanix so that people could import directly into their uh, platform from the URL that's hosted, I guess, in AWS. So they didn't have to download it, uncompress it, and then push it. So those are the two biggest updates I can think of for now. Any uh, feedback or questions uh, for Dusty in terms of the Oracle robots? All right. Well, then let's. That's a perfect transition now to Steve. Steve, go ahead. Take it away. Absolutely. Thank you. So, as folks know, uh, OKD runs on FCOS, and it's it's a pretty awesome stable base for. OKD, but we've been playing with this idea of SCOS, which is really looking at CentOS stream and kind of doing something in between, say, the RHEL core OS and the Fedora core OS. And I know there's kind of rebuilding that happens today with OKD, you know, as, as Christian pointed out there. So I wanted to kind of ask the question, you know, this is something we're still kind of looking at, just our own engineers playing with an idea, but I wanted to broach it more so here to ask, does that sound like something that the community would be interested in, either from the point of view of testing, using, helping, like? I, I don't know if you, if it, Steve, I, you're sort of fading in and out, yeah. Uh, uh, my game. Yeah, still robotic, and I can't really understand you. Yeah. yeah maybe, maybe try turning off your uh, video. It always happens to the person speaking that suddenly internet just goes away. It's like it knows. He's got only like one little red bar on how much bandwidth he has today. Yesterday, somebody was. Losing their um. Thing. Yeah. If if I could try to um. Uh, I I'm I'm Michelle. I'm I'm Steve's colleague. Let's see if he comes any, back. Any better? I. No. Yeah, it, it was audible. That. Yeah, yeah. Your yeah. and your bars look better too, Steve. Yeah, I, all I did was reconnect. I know I, I had no idea. Um, not sure what came through, but but I'll, I'll kind of take a step back here. Um, you should be able to do video now, by the way, because you've got. Let's try hours, it. So yeah. let's try it. Go. Okay. Cool. So effectively, an idea we've been kind of toying with is the idea of SCOS or CoreOS Stream, uh, Core or I'm sorry, CentOS Stream CoreOS, and then you know calling that SCOS. But part of that is part of our own work of wanting to make sure that the work we do is represented in the normal stream for Fedora into Coro stream into RHEL. But that also kind of raised the question, would this be something that could be useful for other communities, such as the OKD community, which currently is built on FCOS, which is, you know, a great place to be built on, but it is, is definitely where a lot of the work happens for what shows up in CentOS stream eventually. 
and and if folks in the community are you know think that's something that that would make sense for us to to look at together um you know what would that look like and how would folks like to engage in that or is there other paths that would be interested in there as well uh, the idea that we've been kind of you know looking at is sort of doing an fcos style of core os you know consistent building consistent releases that kind of stuff a lot of it automated um very similar to fcos but then provided out as that base or whatever you know for our own testing as well as any other community or group that would be so i'll kind of stop there because a lot of the the deeper related stuff you know we don't know right we, we haven't really dived that deep into it yet but did want to bring this earlier rather than later to the community to kind of gauge interest and see what folks think so what is the what is the the, the status of the project on so, so like separate from okd and integration with okd this is something that's happening anyway uh or is it reliant on integration and building along with okd i see christian raised his hand you want to jump in there christian uh, I, I, yeah, please, please do correct me if I say something that's not correct. Um, so I, I do think we will kind of do it anyways, because we will have uh, improved testing, a better testing story, uh, essentially testing on all the platforms currently, as some of you may know, uh, OKD on FCOS isn't really tested end to end on all the platforms, just because we haven't been able to get it working and get the resources. Uh, so this we will use internally as testing, but the, the idea is that the co community can benefit from that as well um, by us just making that those builds available as um, as we've done before, but this time as cost based. And I also want to mention the we, we currently don't have a plan to replace FCOS or OKD on FCOS with this new version. It's going to be an additional release. Um, and so you'll have two variants to pick from essentially uh, going forward, if, if we go through with this, if, if there's interest here, um, where you could say, okay, I, I, I'll try the OKD on, on SCOS instead of the FCOS edition. And then uh, further down the road, we may kind of uh, flip the default over to, to SCOS if, if the community wants that, if the community would like to stay on FCOS for, as a default, uh, we're, we're not gonna flip that switch. Um, if they do, uh, we might do it. Uh, it's really just, um, an offer from from our side. Uh, if if there's interest, we will go through with it. But um, I think entirely we will be doing these builds for for testing because this is essentially our CI early CI testing um, as well. Or early ma on the master branch, it would be the the next release testing. But we can then also replicate those builds from the master branch on the release branches and kind of build a stable release um, on the SCOS space, which is what the OKD community would. Um, would probably consume, um, not, not obviously the master builds. We don't want to uh, give uh, give OKD or release OKD as an experimental version. It's still going to be uh, the stable code bases from all the uh, payload uh, components, as well as then the, uh, the the core operating system of the, uh, this new Central Stream core OS. I'm just going to um, pipe in here that the two folks who are the most vocal about things of this nature that I was hoping to have on the call are, are not here today. Um, and I pinged uh, Neil Gampa and John Fortin to see um, where they were, where they are, but I know they're both very busy folks. So I, I think now that we've um, talked about it a little bit, we'll be able to survey some of the, the group at, and most people watch the recording after we post it. So uh, yeah, so Bruce, Bruce, maybe um, Bruce, if I can put you on the spot, at BCIT, you're you're currently using OKD with FCOS. Um, oh, is this we are. Something, something and and uh, yeah, and and the uh, one of the difficulties with the stream version is that uh, um, I sort of reluctantly went from CentOS XYZ to CentOS Stream uh, with the understanding, based on the discussion, that uh, there were not going to be any further versions. But it was just going to be one stream. But then the last I looked, uh, it was now versioned again. Uh, for I'm not sure what reason. But since the, the uh, difficulty is that uh, with previous CentOSs, there was sort of a an upgrade 
from one version to the next path, and with the stream, there is no upgrade from one version to the next. So it seems that if you actually tried to use it, you would then get locked in to a version that became quickly obsolete, and you couldn't upgrade without reinstalling from scratch. Now, again, this is all hypotheticals, but that would seem to be a, an issue. I think in this case, I, it, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, sorry, go, go ahead, Steve, sorry. So I think in this case, you know, the, the upgrade ability in terms of CoreOS is a little bit different. You know, I don't know the state personally of, of CentOS stream upgrading between things, but the way that CoreOS does the upgrades with RPM OS tree and kind of does pivots and that kind of stuff through containers, I think it is a little bit of a different story. So, you know, looking at different versions, if you look at Fedora CoreOS, how we've gone through multiple versions there, people can keep upgrading forward, um, you know, in the, in the community of FCOS. And then with RCOS, with an open ship, similar thing of people can keep upgrading, even though it's going between, you know, rel versions, um, Y versions, but still rel versions. Um, I think it's, it's a little bit different because um, it would be more cluster focused rather than the operating system I install the operating system and I maintain the operating system and then have to do an upgrade there. But um, but yeah, I think I think it's a little bit different. But but I hear your I hear your statement for sure. Yeah, since it's um, I mean it, it's still it would still be delivered as an OS tree, um, and so theoretically, just like Fedora Core OS today, there's a history. And you could roll back to a previous version in the history and whatnot. Um, so you're not quite at the mercy of like just yum repositories getting updated uh, and going away or something like that. And we actually determine that upgradability through our end to end testing when we do a release. And with SCOS, we're planning to actually do more testing than we've done with FCOS in the past. So that might. We can have even more confidence then that the upgrade is going to succeed. And yeah, as as Dusty mentioned, it's the mechanics are the same as as currently. You essentially rebase to to a new version or yeah pivot from one OS tree to to the next. Um, so it's always you can roll back. And if, obviously, we would have tested that new OS tree commit before. Um, and what, what kind of upgrade graph uh, we would be setting up for this, whether it would be a real Cincinnati graph or just as we have now a, a release controller that essentially runs the end-to-end -end test. And if it's up, determines it's upgradable, it'll it'll create that edge, um, which is only like a stem. We don't really have a tree in, in that uh, release controller graph in FCOS currently. How we how we do this uh, in, in SCOS or how we're going to do this in SCOS, we haven't decided yet. If there's really interest, um, a lot of interest, we might um, might even set up a Cincinnati graph. Although we will, we still have to figure out what kind of uh, resources we we have available for for doing this, and obviously what the interest of from the community side is. We we don't want to do this if there's no no interest there. Christian, could you talk a little bit more about um, for for those of us who are interested, uh, and this would be also for people who will be watching the video later. Um, those are those of us that are interested in sort of the testing and the CI aspect. Um, how does a, a CentOS-based OS improve your testing abilities? Can you provide a little bit of specifics on that? It, it just uh, fits in more tightly with what we with what we currently have already. We can essentially just reuse the tests we already have in place, um, and it's not this the difficulty of, of rebuilding the app cost base pushing it somewhere and then consuming that in our ci system we just build the image in ci and then we consume it immediately that means we could have end-to-end um, -end tests uh, running for okd on the um on the os definitions on the os repository which is the equivalent to the okd machine os um, so we could more easily right now we have this we, we don't really test um, fcos changes um, continuously we, we have um, we, we upgrade the the sub module from time to time that the the fedora core os sub module as well as the the openshift os sub module and so we only have like a, a discrete testing whenever we bump that we, we test again but we don't get this per commit each time um, doing the, the tests 
and that that creates a skew between the, the versions we test and uh, that makes it sometimes very hard to trace back what change caused um, what issue. Yeah. And we think but, that with the new model, that's going to be better. But following up on Jamie's question, uh, why? <laughs> why with the new model is that better? Is uh, like you mentioned having to build the Fedora CoreOS payload before you test it. What about CentOS Stream CoreOS? Is like is that payload already built for us somewhere or not? We, we, we'll still have to uh, create the payload ourselves which is going to be exactly the same process as we've been doing it with FCOS. It's just that the core operating system that we get it right from straight from uh, the core team's build pipeline, essentially, once it's uh, set up. And we don't need this rebuild of FCOS uh, on the outside. And this is actually, this is possible without CoreOS layering. If we had CoreOS layering, we could also move the Fedora build a pipeline back into our prow system um, and that would uh, yeah we wouldn't need the the external uh, serious CI builds anymore uh, in general I think it's uh, it, for us it's testing because it's uh, closer to what what the next Arcos release looks like um, and it's also what was I gonna say uh, it's also it, it may be more, uh, maybe perceived as more stable than, than FCOS, uh, depending on, on, on the user, I guess. Um, and it also will offer a, a sort of feedback loop. If you can, if the community can contribute directly to SCOS, um, the changes will land in, in OCP in the product and obviously in o, uh, OKD as well, uh, much quicker than, than in the current model where you, where, where the community, first of all, doesn't really have a, a point of contact. Um, it's hard to to contribute uh, directly to a component of OpenShift, and con contributing to anything in Fedora, uh, it makes it, it isn't direct. You, you, you then have the Fedora Compose in between, um, and you possibly need to wait for, for the next Fedora CoreOS release uh, till the change lands in, in your OKD payload. And with SCOS, that feedback loop is shorter and we actually have a proper point of contact for the community to contribute to because um, the, the central stream um, community is not, it's not just uh, OpenShift, uh, it's obviously all the, the kind of, yeah, big partners of Red Hat's automotive um, and so on, uh, they, they all contribute to CentOS directly. And with that, the, the OKD community would be in a place to also contribute to CentOS Stream directly and have a yeah have a shorter feedback loop, really. Okay, I want if, to if be mindful of time because we do have um, other guests, and so let's let's spend. We've got three more minutes, let's say, uh, to answer any further questions, and then we can schedule more time maybe at the next meeting. So I'm going to be Sounds respectful good. to our other guests. Yeah, Brian. Do you want to? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I, I did want to bring a, a little bit back to the question of, you know, is this something that sounds interesting to folks in this community and something that we'd like to look at kind of together? That's that's kind of what I'm hoping, you know, to to get to from this this talk. And then Timothy, when he rejoins back up over uh, in the next call, uh, can you know either start working with the community more on details or you know working in other directions around that cost. My, my sense is that the community or the people on this call will probably want to have some async conversation other than just sort of deciding in the next two minutes, like what, you know, uh, what we're thinking and stuff like that. That's, is that my, am I feeling the room right here, folks? Yeah, I'm seeing lots of hints. Yeah. I think we need, we need yeah. to give people time to socialize and, and do this. And, and, and uh, Brian, Brian, you had a, something. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I I just wanted to sort of ask in terms of, uh, first of all, from what Christian said, I, I think it, it sounds like it's something that we want to do. If it's going to mean that we have a better tested, I know John is always very keen, um, especially those that run production, um, having a better tested solution is going to be a better um, end result for the community. But I just wanted to check what is the implication for us, the community, in terms of, documentation updates, we spent quite a lot of time getting docs, okd.io updated, 
we want to make sure that the community can build this distribution. We're, we're doing a lot of work with the Fedora, trying to make sure that we enable the community. We're trying to create the technical documentation. So I just want us to have that side of the conversation as well. So as we launch this, we have the documentation in place. We have the, the transposed images. So the, the, the internal registry, we know what the equivalent images look like for the the SCOS releases and things like that. So I, I just want us not to lose that side of the the discussion as well. Thank you for that. That's good. good reminder. So there are, there are other folks on the call on um, Jack and uh, who's who's going to give I think the next talk. But um, I know this is new to everybody. Um, so you know maybe in the next call when Timothy comes on and can answer more questions and we can socialize this on the mailing list as well and um, you know get get the word out there and reach out to folks like John Fortin and Neil folks who abandoned us today. So um, if you're watching this, this is why you have to come to meetings. Um, so carry on. All right. I, I just very quickly wanted to know, this isn't anything we want to push onto you as a community. If you don't like it, we're not going to do it. Um, it's just an additional option. We, you know, you can definitely stay on FCOS if, if, if you're comfortable and if that's what you want to do. Um, we really want to just gauge um, is there interest here in the broad, broader community? Would there be potential users in, in this group? Uh, so we, we don't just do this work and uh, end up without anybody using it. Um, then we'll likely just do it on our master branches for, for CI testing, not not actually build the release branches for, for stable OKD release. All right, great. So nobody needs to worry that we're going to, you know, uh, Pro FCOS, uh, OKD on FCOS in the trash or anything. That's gonna, that's here to stay, um, and this is just an additional variant as an option. Awesome, thanks, Christian. Okay, let's now move on. Um, we, uh, Steve, we'll get back to you and the other folks um, once we've had a little bit of uh, asynchronous conversation and and folks have had a chance to sort of flesh out their thoughts for sure. Thanks, uh, let's go now to um, Jack to talk about OKD at CERN. I know we've got a lot of people that are interested to hear these details. So take it away, Jack. Hey, hello. Thanks for having me. Can you hear me well? All right. Yes. Excellent. Um, so yeah, uh, we, we met at uh, KubeCon actually like uh, two weeks ago or so now. And um, yeah, in this uh, community meeting, I just wanted to share a bit uh, kind of what we're doing with OKD or specifically our use cases. I've been bothering some people and on kind of the, the weird uh, deployment scenario that we have here, but I'm not going to go in, into that this time, um, but more focus on the use cases. So we've been running uh, OpenShift for, for quite a while at CERN now. I think it was since like 2016, 17, somewhere around there. And the initial draw was really the fact that uh, the, the deployment pipelines and the build configs, so deployment configs and build configs were integrated because at the time we were looking for something that we could use together with GitLab. And GitLab did not have the integrated GitLab CI. So the question was, how do people build containers and then how do they deploy them? And this is kind of the was kind of the first use case for, for that OpenShift was really interesting and also the fact that it had, had a good user interface so we could easily onboard people for that. Uh, so we, we that, this was kind of the driver to, to adopt uh, OpenShift at, at CERN. And now since uh, I would say two and a half years, we've been rolling out OKD4 and uh, we've massively broadened uh, the use case for it. Um, and so we, we basically have four different cluster flavors as we're calling them. And the first one is kind of the standard platform as a service uh, scenario where we just give people the, the OpenShift console. They can deploy their applications. They can do deployment configs. They can do build configs. They can do all of the standard Kubernetes and OpenShift stuff basically in their own projects, completely isolated. And the benefit for, for our users is just that they don't need to take care of their clusters. I want to mention that we also have an offering of regular Kubernetes clusters at CERN, which is also heavily used by users who 
let's say, know what they're doing, who have a really large workload sometimes, and uh, where they just also want to have full control over the entire environment in which they're running in. So that also involves then monitoring, logging, et cetera, et cetera. But OpenShift is really more targeted at, or OKD in our case, uh, our deployment is more targeted at, at users who just want to run some simple or sometimes also not so simple web apps, um, any kind of um, application that, that is, is less power hungry. Um, so this is what we are calling the, or what we have as the platform as a service cluster flavor. Then in addition, we also have uh, what's called web EOS. So CERN has its own um, file system that is called EOS, uh, which is backed by tape drives in our data center actually. And uh, this is used heavily at CERN for storing large amounts of data. And uh, people are also using this to host websites. And uh, this web EOS cluster is then kind of as a, serving as the front end for this. And uh, we, we decided to go with the operator approach here so that we allow users to create these custom resource definitions that our, are served by our operators that basically say something like, hey, I have a, I have a folder here in the, on the EOS file system and uh, I want to have it available under this host name and then some other parameters. And then basically uh, the website becomes online and uh, the user doesn't need to take care of any kind of web hosting. We are doing it all for them. And that includes both static websites as well as dynamic websites with PHP or other kinds of CGI things. So this is what you, back in the day, you used to have under your, your home folder when you made like, uh, you had a public folder or www folder. That's basically still the, con the concept. And I think at, at the time of, of speaking, we have around 3000 websites who are hosted like that. Then our, our third use case is the, is the Drupal use case where, uh, where, because Drupal is the most widely used CMS at CERN. And so, for example, if you go to home.cern, you will land on one of the pages that is managed by, by this cluster. And uh, my colleagues from the Drupal team, they really went all in with the operator approach. So it's also an OKD cluster. But in addition, there are several operators deployed on top of it that really give, uh, give this uh, CMS a fully managed experience. Because Drupal, uh, managing Drupal is a relatively complex procedure because you need to not only keep track of the application, which is already difficult enough because it's not really a cloud native application. It has a lot of state uh, that you need to take care of. You cannot just randomly do upgrades or updates. But then in addition, you also need to do, do things like uh, managing your database schemas, uh, managing migrations there, et cetera. So it's, it's quite a lot of components that need to come together in addition to other things like authentication and logging. And all of these things are really bundled into a very, very simple web interface uh, managed by my Drupal colleagues. And all of that is managed with, like I said, various operators running on, on OKD and uh, really hooking into the infrastructure that OKD gives us. And of course, the extensibility also. And um, then the fourth cluster that we have is, is where we're currently ramping up is where we're trying to, to be kind of between the platform as a service use case and these more managed op, uh, approaches. So there we are trying to give users application templates for commonly used applications at CERN. So this is something, uh, one of the, the really good use cases is a Grafana instance. Uh, we could just tell our users, hey, you can just install this Helm chart in your PAS uh, cluster or in your, in your project there. And then you have a Grafana instance and that would be fine. But uh, it's, it just seems like a little bit too much overhead uh, just to spin up a Grafana instance. So in, in this uh, app catalog cluster, as we're calling it, you have several applications available as templates, which you can then instantiate. And they are again backed by operators. But uh, here we are still using the OKD UI. Uh, so with the operator catalog. Um, and that also works nicely. And like I said, at the moment, we are we're kind of ramping up there. So we are, we are working on 
providing more uh, application templates to the users such that they, that they can really uh, easily get going. And then sometimes it also happens that we find that a user has two specific needs um, to be hosted on this cluster, or we would need to add some really, really uh, specific uh, configuration settings to, a, to an application, which we don't want to add there because it's, it's really supposed to serve the 80 or 90% of users and not like the 10% the, the of ugly ducklings. But then it's at the same time really easy to kind of move users over to uh, from from one cluster to another uh, and and just tell them, hey, you're an advanced user. You clearly know what you're doing because you're requesting a, a really uh, un uncommon feature. So uh, here are the instructions to to go set that up yourself. And then uh, they they again have their own project and they can do whichever kind of modifications they like. But uh, in this app catalog cluster, we are we are really only allowing the creation of custom resource definitions, but we are not allowing any any other modifications. So users are not allowed to to modify their deployments, their services, their pods. They can see that they are running there, but they are not allowed to modify them. And uh, also, this approach actually works works quite nicely for us because most people are actually fine with with what you give, what you give them out of the box. Sometimes we get some feature requests, then we implement new things. And uh, if we see that it's too obscure or that it's too specific, then we just redirect the user uh, into our general purpose cluster. And um, all in all, so we have we have these four very large production clusters, and I should also say rather high density. Um, <clears throat> so the clusters themselves are not super large. They have around 60 nodes. Uh, worker nodes, um, but each of them is hosting around 1,000 user projects, so that's individual user namespaces. Um, and as a result of this, we've also seen some interesting challenges actually scaling all of the operators to handle that workload because uh, uh, the, the mem especially we've seen that the memory consumption can get uh, quite large. Excellent. What are some of the challenges that you've come across in terms of building your own OKD, uh, in terms of automating the process, in terms of getting components to, to rebuild it? What are some of the challenges you've come across? Well, the, the main, uh, I, di I didn't go into this. Um, the main challenge is the fact that at CERN, we don't have a full OpenStack deployment, the way you have it uh, when you, for example, deploy a Red Hat uh, OpenStack. But mainly we just have the OpenStack compute part. And we have a little bit of OpenStack networking, but this is also not fully standard, uh, mainly due to the fact that, uh, well, CERN had its uh, the same kind of networking flat uh, network layout for the last 30 or 40 years in the data center. And of course, it's it's very hard to change that. So, for example, our OpenStack uh, network has no SDN, uh, and that uh, for this reason we cannot de deploy uh, a regular OKD and just tell it to to deploy to OpenStack platform, because then it will start to to set up the whole SDN machinery. Uh, it will start to to spin up Ceph shares uh, that are. For example, in our case, backed by by uh, by or sorry, Manila shares, which are backed by CephFS, but the OKD installer actually expects the NFS backend. All of these sorts of things, which you would just have if you had a like a regular vanilla OpenStack deployment, uh, which we don't have. So we really have mainly have the compute and everything around. Uh, we need to kind of integrate ourselves. So it's mainly around storage, uh, logging networking and uh, also some authentic authentication parts um yeah i'm, I'm not sure if, if that already answered the question or or if i should go into into more details there sure. well christian has his uh, hand up christian go ahead yeah let me just uh start by saying i, I find this super cool uh as an open trip developer um it makes me proud that certain runs Runs OKD, um, this is awesome. Um, and th thank you for, for coming here and presenting this to us. I, I really uh, enjoy this, this is awesome. Um, I'm, I wonder, 
your uh, OKD build process? Well, do do you just consume a standard payload, or do you do any? Do you switch out any images? What, what what's your build process or your preparation process for uh, for making a an OKD payload? Yeah, so so you already hinted in the right direction. So we take the the OKD releases from from GitHub basically, and then we start switching out some of the some of the images that are inside, which is uh, luckily relatively easy. So uh, uh, we can just use the the overbrighting of the images, and then we basically those images that we need to have replaced, um, we just build ourselves. But I would also say that a good amount of infrastructure we are actually just deploying ourselves. Uh, because we are basically telling the OpenShift installer to install to platform none, and then you don't even get that much out of the box. But we kind of need to deploy it ourselves. So examples examples would here would be the OpenStack Cloud Controller Manager, um, DevFS integrations, uh, logging integrations also. So we we don't use the cluster logging operator, but kind of our own deployment there. And all of this we do actually with with RGCD on top of OKD. That's cool. Great to hear that you're using RGCD. Uh, any other questions from folks uh, here? We've got uh, about five more minutes left. A little under five minutes. I just um, I um, this is me. Just curious um, what you heard earlier today about the the S the CentOS Stream Core OS. Would that be anything that um, you think that, and I know it's just first time you've heard about it, is that anything that would help your processes? Is it having a, a more stable? Um, is that anything you think they would be interested in, or is it you know too much work to, to switch now that you've got that build process and handcrafted everything? Yeah, so, so not, uh... I'm going to say not super excited simply because of the fact that we don't usually need to touch the machine OS image, uh, which is, of course, a good thing. That's how it should be. <laughs> it's just underlying infrastructure. Um, we also probably, unless we, we, we have to or we see any immediate benefits, uh, we would not uh, switch uh, because we already have our current deployments. But I can say that uh, at the end of last year, there was this uh, issue where, I, I don't recall the details, but where, where kernels had deadlocks, uh, where one of our clusters was quite heavily affected, and that was a, a kernel bug, basically. Uh, so we had to actually roll back uh, to one of the previous uh, images or kernels, and that was relatively painful in uh, core OS uh, simply due to the RPM OS tree and you cannot just uh, easily monkey around. So it took us quite a while to then figure out how we can build our own uh, machine OS image with a custom kernel inside. So I'm not sure if that would be something that's easier with with uh, the, the stream approach or not, but... Uh... I think this is not necessarily going to be easier with CentOS Stream. And oh, okay, I think right. um, users won't notice the difference, uh, just as ideally right now you wouldn't notice the difference between OKD and OCP, uh, because it's really the, the OS is supposed to be an implementation detail. In yeah. Our well, um, in that case, I'm just going to summarize no, it by saying no strong preference. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I do think that the CoreOS layering, which we'll eventually get in both FCOS and SCOS, uh, will make this easier because you'll be more easy. It'll, it'll just be much easier to, to make your own machine OS um, because we, you don't need to, to do the RPM OS tree compose. You can kind of just layer your changes on top of the existing one. And using a Docker file, which is uh, like the dev experience, is amazing already. Uh, so this is uh, Steve's team. Um, and, and Timothy and all, the core team, and they've been doing amazing work, uh, and Dusty, obviously, um, on, on that front. I'm really looking forward to landing that into OKD. Uh, so th that would be uh, one thing that will make it easier, but that will be valid for both SCOS and also FCOS. Yeah, <clears throat> definitely interested in the, uh, the bad experience with the rollback, though. Like, theoretically, the rollback should be pretty straightforward, at least at the RPM OS tree level. Um, the only reason you'd need to build your own machine OS content is like if you wanted to diverge 
for like a period of time, right? So like, let's say there's a bug that doesn't get fixed for a month and a half and you want to update everything else. Um, yeah, th this was exactly the situation we were in. So we didn't we didn't specifically roll back, but we wanted to have a a specific kernel version basically in the in the image, uh, and, and that was kind of the painful part. Uh, and it was of course mainly painful because we let's say kind of didn't know what we were doing because we're not core as developers. Like that's not uh, not our bread and butter. Uh, and then once you figure it out, you kind of understand okay why this works that way. And uh, but at the time, also, we couldn't find a lot of documentation how to build your own machine OS image, so that that's why it was really quite painful. Yeah, uh, well, you should have been able to just do it all client side, so you could have done an override replace for a specific kernel, and the client would have kept that, right? Um, but yes, CoreOS layering will make it much easier just to override like a specific package or whatnot, and then carry that delta until you know, your particular problem gets fixed. Mm -hmm. So I want to get to, Michelle had a comment uh, to share, and then we have a hand up. Yeah, Alexander. Yeah, I, um, I'm, I'm happy to hear folks talking about layering. If that is something that folks would be interested in, we definitely are interested in your interest. <laughs> there is a GitHub repository um, of uh, examples. Um, you know, we lo would very much love your feedback, um, even if it was just l visually looking at um, the, the workflow, um, adding another example, requesting another example, or um, even if this would be something that um, is so interesting that you'd, you'd love to be the leading edge for that. And it is um, a, a pretty significant change and uh, an active conversation about um, how, to, how to release this um, and be able to get feedback um, as we go along. So if, this, if there is enough interest um, in in the community, then it, it could possibly be something we would um, consider offering on OKD first um, that, that has been raised before. But if there's interest, that would be interesting. So uh, I just posted um, a, um, some examples, and feedback is very much welcome. And uh, Alessandro, I think you had a question for Jack. Hello. Nice to meet you. Um, so yeah, uh, it was, mm, it's more that uh, I was wondering. So I imagine that uh, in your cluster, we have four clusters with 16 workers nodes that are mm, at least not too much, but it's great. Christian was saying that before. And as, um, mm, as you, I can imagine that there are a lot of sensitive data in the logs and as in the metrics that you have about the cluster, but I'm wondering whether as a research institution that you are, you could anonymize some of the logs that you have and the metrics that you collect in your cluster and publish them, uh, because that's why I'm saying that but, uh, in the past, uh, before joining it up, since I did a lot of research about Kubernetes cluster, OKD clusters, and one of the big issues that we had uh, in the research uh, institution was having data about workloads in, the, in, the, in those kind of clusters from CPU, memory to networking especially. And, and there are projects that are arising like the network observability operator for that do work, I think, on OKD2, and that could help collecting data about the cluster and, and anonymizing them and putting them available like um, some projects else within the app, like Operate First do, could be very interesting for a lot of universities, a lot of people around the world that want to improve things uh, in those kind of environments. Yeah, I think that's a that's a two part thing, right? Jack, is is there any overall documentation on this project online? First question, and then second question. You know, in terms of would there be a way to anonymize data to help improve the the running of these types of clusters? So I don't think there's a overall online documentation available anywhere. Um, it's uh, simply because, well, it's uh, we didn't really see a need for that. Um, but uh, in terms of 
is sharing some of the data uh, anonymously, I, I, I think it would surely be possible, though I didn't understand in which uh, format this should happen. Uh, I know that they're like OpenShift clusters are sending some structured logging somewhere to Red Hat if you enable that. Are we talking about this or are we talking about some general purpose data dump? No, I'm not talking about the telemetry data. I was talking more about data that are in Prometheus or the ones that are in the logging operator and that comes from the workers that you run, not from the uh, control plane. Okay, so you say you have hundreds of workloads running on top of, okay, the, that data will be very, uh, I can say, gold for people in the research community. Okay, and there are very few repositories that provides data of this kind, like Alibaba Cloud, which is providing their them in the format of a CSV, but they are very, very poor in terms, of, in terms of quality. And the same happens for some data that comes from 2018 from the Google Borg experience. Today, they are also in the CSV format in that case. But I mean, also mm, the format can be whatever we, uh, uh, whatever. Mm, usually people use CSV in uh, the research community, but I can also Thing that hundreds of workloads, thousands uh, of loads in production can be very huge, and so other formats can be without any format could be very good. But this extracting it from images and any other operators that do that does um, observability on top so on top of this cluster, and I don't know making them available uh, on GitHub. Uh, and, yeah, I'm, I'm not uh, generally against it. Uh, we would need to look into it. And uh, I mean, we cannot just give a full dump of our Prometheus instance uh, to whichever data is in there. And of course, the same for the logs. Um, but uh, if, if there is some kind of framework for providing anonymous uh, metrics and, and logs, um, we could surely look into it. Excellent. Any other questions or comments for Jack? We've got about four more minutes in the meeting. Um, Marco has graciously agreed to come back to our next meeting uh, to talk about that topic. So we've got about four more minutes to, to ask questions of Jack or any other things related to OKD. So the, the next, in two weeks time, we'll have Marco back. Um, we'll also have Timothy back. Um, to do more of a deep dive and answer any questions that we come up with around the SCOS stuff, as well as I'm going you know, to try and get um, Brian Cook um, to come to talk about um, building a community hosted and managed process for um, OKD um, and FCOS. So um, to move that conversation forward as well. So. Yeah, and again, Jack, um, you made my day talking about CERN. Um, I've known in the background that you've been doing that for ages, um, and it's just nice to, um, to hear the details. So thank you for sharing that today. Well, thanks very much for having me, and uh, thanks to all of you who are working on OpenShift or OKD, uh, working, developing it every day, making it better, faster. Uh, we are very happy users, and uh, yeah, thanks again. And we'll have you back on for an update uh, to tell us what new things you've discovered and new things you're working on. For yes, sure. for sure. And also, if you have uh, any specific questions, feel free to, to reach out to me. And uh, well, otherwise, uh, I guess I'll see you in uh, future OKD community meetings. Awesome. Thanks, Jack. All right, folks, any last thoughts uh, before we end the meeting? All right, Doc's meeting is next week, same uh, time and channel. Uh, main meeting is two weeks from now. Meeting minutes are now getting posted um, as time permits uh, up on the OKD website and videos are, are coming. Uh, we've got a little bit of a backlog, but they're making their way. So I, thanks I very much, get, folks. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. I'll just say I'm going to get today's um, out to you right away as soon as it's rendered um, so that we can socialize this and the folks that weren't on the call um, please do um, give us your feedback on the mailing list um, and in the Slack channels and, and come to two weeks from now um, with your questions. 
Oh, one last thing. The docs group did sign off on the survey, so the OKD survey is ready to go out. Uh, so we'll be promoting that through the various channels um, and hopefully get some feedback from OKD users to help uh, uh, make a bit more welcoming community and maybe steer things moving. Thanks, Thanks to everybody so. for joining today. Much appreciated. Bye, everybody. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.